In today's episode, we are going over an evidence-based guide to physical therapy rehabilitation after arthroscopic rotator cuff repair surgery. Let's do it. All right, so what's the problem with rotator cuff repair surgery? Well, first and foremost, rotator cuff related pain is the number one most common type of shoulder pain reported in the medical literature. It is extremely common and therefore the repair is actually common as well. One of the issues with rotator cuff repairs is that they will often re-tear and the rates are highly dependent on the type of tear. However, in some studies are as high as 94%, right? So essentially almost hundred percent of all rotator cuff tears in some studies will re-tear over the course of time, right? And this is not common for the majority of rotator cuff repairs, obviously, but it does end up getting a little alarming from a physical therapy standpoint, because we actually do know that what we choose from a physical therapy perspective to do with our patients will influence their outcomes and also influences whether or not they re-tear over the course of time, right? So if I go too fast, am I going to cause a retear? Uh, if I'm not going fast enough, will I not facilitate healing, right? Uh, what should a physical therapist do? The other piece that becomes very, very confusing is that there's a huge variance in different protocols in patients that have rotator cuff repair surgery. You may have one patient that comes in and the physician has no sling on the patient and active range of motion starts at, let's say, four weeks. You might have another patient that comes in at week 10 and they were in a sling for six weeks and they're not allowed to do any sort of strengthening until they get to month three or month four even, right? So there's huge variance between different protocols. And the other piece is that the medical literature is relatively clear in the sense that some tears can potentially be pushed a little faster than others. So it's not just like every single rotator cuff tear repair should be treated the same, right? And the thing is, as a physical therapist, we want to try to optimize our outcomes. We want to minimize the risk of retears. So how the heck should we go about this? What should physical therapy rehabilitation look like? And what should be those differences from patient A to patient B with different size tears, different occupations, going back to different sports, et cetera, et cetera. So in today's episode, we're going to go over outcomes following rotator cuff repair surgery. Does the surgery work well? Are patients happy, satisfied? Do they get back to their sport after they finish up getting the repair surgery. Should you immobilize and put a sling on the shoulder following rotator cuff repair? When should you initiate range of motion exercises? And this goes for passive range of motion as well as active range of motion. Is there a difference between accelerated physical therapy program and more standard or conservative programs? What are factors that are going to influence the rate of progression and also healing rates? And lastly, what are return to sport times and rates? Are people returning back to sport? Are they getting back to the same level as did before? Is there a difference between different types of sports, right? And lastly, how about barbell athletes? So the folks that we love working with, you know, as physical therapists that really enjoy strength and fitness. Now, before we really get going, I want to let you know about a free resource. I have made a rotator cuff tendinopathy and rotator cuff tear evidence-based cheat sheet for you to check out. It's 100% free. I'll put a link in the show notes. You can check it out. We go over, go over rotator cuff tear prevalence, anatomy, the difference between a tendonitis and tendinosis. We go over risk factors for tears and tendinopathy. We go over the clinical presentation, common tear types, rehab expectations, as well as surgical candidates. So who is the best candidate for rotator cuff repair surgery? Because not all folks are going to need surgery. So we'll go over all of that in this cheat sheet. I'll leave the link in the show notes, 100% free. Go grab it. And welcome to the Fitness Pain-Free Show. This is where we help coaches and physical therapists like yourself get your patients out of pain and back in the gym where they belong. My name is Dan Pope. I'm a physical therapist. I'm a coach, personal trainer, and a meathead. I love all things fitness. I have my dream job as a physical therapist, coach, business owner, and educator, and I've been doing it for a few decades now. My goal is to help you reach your goals so you can be as happy as I am. Now, I want to put a little standard disclaimer in the mix here. Uh, if you are an individual that just had rotator cuff repair, this is in no ways a guide to your rehabilitation. All right. You definitely want to try to get guidance from a physical therapist or surgeon. Do not take my advice. Do not go ahead and just do everything that I talk about here today. I think it's very important that I state that. The second piece is that I am not going to include a protocol here. This is not going to say week two, start this week four, start this. I'm really kind of summarizing the evidence and just helping you to critically reason as a physical therapist or a coach to try to figure out what's best for your patient, right? 
If you want some really good in-depth information on how to treat rotator cuff repairs, I highly recommend you checking out anything from Kevin Wilk. Uh, I call him the rotator cuff repair master. He has a ton of great courses out there. Lots of good free information as well. Go into Google, throw in his name next to rotator cuff. You'll find all sorts of great stuff. And lastly, if you do want a decent protocol, I find myself recommending the protocols over in the University of Delaware quite a bit. And uh, I'll leave those uh, protocols as a link in the show notes if you want to check that out. They have a bunch of really good protocols for rotator cuff repair. This is part four of a four-part series on the rotator cuff. If you haven't checked out parts one through three, I'll leave a link in the show notes. Definitely check those out before proceeding. Otherwise, enjoy. So let's talk a little bit more about return to sport after rotator cuff repair. So in this study, they were looking at partial thickness tears that were greater than 50% torn, right? Uh, so generally speaking, partial thickness tears in general, but especially less than 50% torn, usually don't have surgery with these, right? Generally, they're treated conservatively. We don't have to cut these folks open immediately, right? Thing is, in most athletes, they tend to be younger, right? So the majority of folks playing sports are not 65 to 7 year old, right? They're somewhere between, let's say, 15 and 20, okay? And the thing about rotator cuff tears is they tend not to happen until later in life, except if you play an overhead sport, then they happen a little bit faster. Uh, but that being said, usually you'll see smaller cuff tears in younger patients simply because they're not old enough to start acquiring these tears, right? So in the study, they were looking at repair of partial thickness tears, right? Greater than 50%. Uh, do keep in mind that this is not as severe an injury as let's say a full thickness cuff tear. So you take this data with a grain of salt. What was cool is that they took these patients, they put them into four different groups, right? And they were basically putting them in the buckets based on the sports they played. So they had a non-collision, non-overhead shoulder sport group. They had a high impact and collision sport group, an overhead sport. They didn't differentiate between, let's say, volleyball or tennis or um, pitchers, which we'll talk about a little bit later in baseball. And also had a category for martial arts, right? What they found largely was that 87% of those folks were able to return to sports and 80% of those people returned to sport at the same level. Okay. That's actually pretty solid. The average return to sport time was around 5.6 months. And they also said that functional outcomes were not related to the type of sport or the level of competition before the injury, right? So if you were a professional athlete, it doesn't mean that it was harder for you to get back to sport compared to just a recreational athlete that's not necessarily playing at a very high level. Okay. Uh, however, this is just in one study. This evidence is a little bit mixed. Obviously, all this all research is a bit mixed, but at least in this study, didn't show a difference. Anderson et al. in 2020 put out a meta-analysis of 347 athletes, 81 of which are competitive, and 266 of which were recreational. And they were trying to decide if there's a difference between returning to sport if you were a recreational athlete versus a competitive athlete, right? So if you want to get back to a very high level of play, maybe you don't have that same um, positive outcome compared to someone that's trying to get back to a lower level of play, right? So you're looking at a variety of different sports. Um, the biggest sport included was baseball, then golf, then football, and then tennis, right? And what I will say about the baseball subgroup, and you'll find this a little bit smattered uh, across, you know, our medical literature. If you want to look at any of these publications, I have citations. They're all going to be in the show notes if you want to check them out. So essentially, outcomes after rotator cuff repair and overhead athletes are significantly poor and return to sport remains unpredictable when compared to other populations, right? So if you're a baseball athlete trying to get back to pitching, uh, you might not have the best outcome generally position players, maybe they're a little bit better and sports with th that don't require pitching, um, probably going to be a little bit better too. Right. But at least in this study, what they found was the overall rate of return to sport, at a similar level of play or higher was 70%. Okay. So relatively decent, right? Two thirds of folks are getting back to their sport, right? The same level of play. What they also found is that 73% of recreational athletes got back at the same level of play but only 60% of competitive athletes were able to return, right? So at least in this study, what they found is that if you were a more competitive athlete, you were less likely to get back at the desired level of play than someone who's more recreational, okay? And the other piece, and I, I kind of alluded to this previously, uh, in this study, a subset of 43 baseball and softball players across four studies 
yielded a 79% uh, rate of return to sport. However, only 38% returned to the same level of play or higher, right? So essentially, if you're a baseball player, especially returning back to pitching, uh, rotator cuff repairs is a tough thing to recover from. And your rates of getting back at the same level of play are probably going to be diminished, right? This is not to take away hope from folks, you know, from pitchers that get rotator cuff repair. Uh, but it is one of those things that's in the back of my mind when I have a baseball pitcher who has a rotator cuff uh, tear, I'm deciding whether or not the best course of action is to refer for surgery or try to do something more conservative. So guys, if you like what you're learning about so far, then I want you to go and check out the fitness pain-free mini course. So I made a mini course. It's absolutely free. That's the next logical step. If you want to learn more from me. So in the course, we go over five lessons. That first lesson is how traditional schooling has failed us, right? So schooling is phenomenal from a physical therapy perspective, but doesn't really teach you how to work with high level athletes in the fitness world, right? Doesn't always teach you how to do the lifts appropriately. Doesn't teach you about progressions and regressions of common lifts within the gym. Doesn't teach you how to program normally, how to write rehab programs or how to write injury prevention programs for these folks. Next thing we go over, seven reasons why people get hurt in the gym, four simple steps to getting your clients out of pain, how to build the career of your dreams and earn the respect of your community. It's all well and good if you know exactly how to work with folks within the gym. But if you can't get these folks through the door on a regular basis, then you're simply not going to be living the dream that you want to because you can't get the patients through the door that you want to work with. Okay, so I'll show you how to do that. And lastly, we'll talk a little bit about the fitness pain free certification, right? So I'll leave a link in the show notes. I definitely recommend checking this out. Once you sign up for the fitness pain free mini course, you will be automatically placed in the wait list for the fitness pain free certification. Now, the fitness pain free certification is the course, the certification that I wish I had as a new grad that fills in all the gaps in knowledge that you don't get in physical therapy school. So A, you'll gain complete confidence working with injuries in the strength and fitness world. You'll learn optimal technique for both health and performance from myself and some of the best coaches in the world. You'll master programming for rehabilitation and injury prevention. Have fun while earning a whole bunch of physical therapy and physical therapy assistance credits. You have 31.5 of those. You'll also gain NSCA credits as well as CrossFit credits if you need those. This is the equivalent of a university education in working with injuries in the weight room. I really believe that. I've been adding to this thing over the past five or six years. It's massive, a ton of phenomenal information. And lastly, the biggest goal is just to fill your day with the patients you love working with and building the respect and admiration of the communities you love working with. So I'll leave a link in the show notes. Sign up for the Fitness Pain-Free mini course. The certification is open four times per year for one week to enroll into. If you're on the wait list by signing up for the fitness pain-free mini course, I'll alert you when that next enrollment period is open and you can get started. Let's get back to the show now. So how about return to sport rates for CrossFit, right? This is fitness pain-free, right? I specialize in fitness, strength sports, barbell athletes. If I am involved in those sports, right? And those activities, I love CrossFit. I love Olympic weightlifting, powerlifting. <clears throat> What's going to be my return to sport rate? Well, there was a cool study by Cardone et al. in 2020, and I've actually done an entire fitness pain-free show about this study. So I'll leave a link in the show notes. You guys can definitely check that out. Um, but what was really cool is that they were looking at return to sport rate um, of CrossFit athletes, right, after rotator cuff repair surgery, okay? Now, a small study, only 22 CrossFit athletes, but it was pretty cool because those guys were pretty intense. I think they were spending somewhere like 8 to 10 hours per week worth of training, which is more than the average recreational person. Uh, they had a single row rotator cuff tendon repair. I believe they had partial thickness as well as full thickness uh, tears in the mix. And what was really cool is that 100% of these individuals returned to intensive CrossFit training. So return to that same um, above recreational level of participation, right? The average time for return to sport was 8.7 months plus or minus 3.4 months after surgery. That range was somewhere between 6 and 15 months. 59% of individuals indicated a return to fitness at a higher level than they started. That's really good. 32% returned at the same level, right? And only 9% returned to a lower level. So at least what's pretty cool about rotator cuff repair and CrossFit athletes is that the majority of them are going to get back, and the majority actually get back at the same or higher level of function, a small bit of those folks are not going to get back to the same level, uh, but largely that's a good outcome, right? So if you have a, a big rotator cuff tear, 
you're a CrossFitter, um, I'm a little less likely to be uh, scared of you getting a rotator cuff repair because we know these tend to do pretty dang good. If you guys are liking what you're listening to right now and you want to continue with the rolling, I have another video for you. It's called When Do Rotator Cuff Repairs Fail? So unfortunately, a chunk of these rotator cuff repair surgeries will fail, right? And it's important as physical therapists to know when these are actually occurring so we can be a little bit more cautious during this time period. So I'll leave a link above my head and go ahead and learn a little bit more about when rotator cuff repairs fail after surgery. Lastly, I just want to say thank you so much for your support. You truly allow me to do what I love for a living. If you're watching this on YouTube, hit that like button. Leave a comment for me. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this and subscribe to the channel. It helps me out tremendously. If you are listening or viewing the podcast version of this, please leave me a positive rating and review. It helps out tremendously. It allows me to continue doing what I love to do and helping you guys out in the process. If you want to go that extra step in supporting me, consider subscribing to Insiders. What's Insiders? It's a comprehensive educational resource and toolkit for the fitness and rehab professional. All this content is produced by me. Think Netflix, but for trainers and physical therapists. It's premium content similar to this podcast, but more in-depth. So if, if you really like what you're learning from Fitness Pain Free, this is that next step to go deeper with your learning. I've been updating it monthly for the past five years or so. There's a tremendous amount of information in there. You've got over 100 webinars, ebooks, and complete guides. You have access to a private Facebook group where you can have all of your questions answered by me. You can decide upcoming podcast epi episodes. It's cheap to get started. There's a $1 one-week trial. Afterwards, it's just 10 bucks a month. And lastly, you can cancel any time. So if you want to get started, I'll leave a link in the show notes, or you can head over to fitnesspainfree.com, click on the programs link, and then click on Fitness Pain Free Insiders Online Library to get going. Lastly, if you want to check out any of the references, I'm going to leave those in the show notes as well. You can see exactly where I'm getting this information from.